Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hugging Face. This is part two of our quantization expedition. So if you did not watch part one, I recommend that you do that because I will not reintroduce the basic concepts. If you did watch it, then in this video, we're going to keep exploring quantization techniques. Smooth quant, GPTQ, EWQ, HQQ, lots of Qs as well as the quantization techniques available for Intel platforms in our own Optimum Intel library. Let's get started. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to enable notifications so that you won't miss future videos. Also, why not share this video on your social networks or with your colleagues? Because if you found this useful, others may find it useful too. Thank you very much for your support. I will stay off screen for this because the slides are a little busy and I, I don't want my uh, stupid face to mask some of the content. Smooth quant is a post-training quantization technique and you can apply it dynamically or statically with a calibration data set. One of the key findings in smooth quant is that activations are much harder to quantize than weights because they display a much larger uh, numerical range. And so, to solve that problem, smooth quant introduces a pretty interesting idea, which is can't we migrate some of the quantization difficulty to the weight layers, right? Instead of trying hard to quantize huge ranges of activations, can we tweak the weights so that we reduce that range of activations? Right, that's that's pretty clever, and uh, this is exactly what they do. So, they rescale weights so that the range, uh, the magnitude of the uh, of the activation ranges, are reduced, uh, making them easier to quantize. So, pretty clever technique, right? And here's um, um, how they show it in their in the paper. So, on the left. Uh, you see uh, uh, the activation values, right? Or I guess an example where uh, you see on the x-axis the, uh, the the channels, so the different uh, the different dimensions, and on the y-axis you see the actual uh, activation values, and you see some uh, some channels uh, have extreme magnitude and how would you try to quantize that stuff in, in a meaningful way, right? There's just too much difference across, uh, across different dimensions. So to simplify the problem, then, uh, they apply a mathematical formula to rescale the weights so that activation values exhibit uh, much more reasonable ranges, right? So now activation values are much more reasonable and easier to quantize. And weights are maybe a little uh, spikier because we did introduce uh, maybe slightly larger ranges in the, in the weight tensors, but they're still easier to quantize than the original activation. So it's literally, uh, you know, divide and conquer, I would say. Uh, you know, spread out the problem uh, instead of trying to, uh, to quantize those impossible activations. So they apply this to the self-attention and the linear layers, and then they quantize the linear layers to 8-bit integers. Now, the result is that smooth quant is as accurate as uh, bits and bytes, which we covered in the previous video, but it is much faster. So here's a, here's a benchmark where we see very large models, uh, OPT-170B, Bloom-176B, GLM-130B, so you know, all, all very, very large LLMs. And we see the FP16 baseline in the, in the blue highlight, and we see the smooth quant results. Um, and O1, O2, O3 are just different optimization levels in, in smooth quant. Uh, you can check out the paper if you're interested in details. But you can see uh, we pretty much pretty much match the um, the accuracy of the baseline with smooth quant, right? So uh, we quantize from FP16 to in8 with a zero performance degradation. 
Um, we generally outperform um, bits and bytes, which is referred as uh, LLM int eight in that uh, uh, in that uh, table. Uh, we obviously outperform uh, zero quant, right? And you can see how poorly zero quant does on uh, on those models compared to to the baseline, particularly on uh, OPT one seventy five and and GLM. Um, so zero quant really does on scale to very large models. Um, bits and bytes does a really good job, but as we saw, inference performance is is a problem, and uh, smooth quant matches the accuracy. And when it comes to speed, uh, we can see smooth quant is uh, is faster across the board, right? So the the gray bars are FP16, and uh, the reddish bars are smooth quant, and we can see. Even for smaller LLMs like OPT13B, uh, there is a very nice speed up, um, and the speed up is very significant for uh, the larger models, right? So across the board, smooth quant is pretty fast, and because obviously we did shrink the models, uh, obviously we can use fewer GPUs to get to that level of performance. For example, if we look at uh, OPT175B. Um, we only need four GPUs to load the model, the quantized model, instead of eight to load the FP16 model. So in terms of cost performance, this is, this is awesome because cost is um, 2x lower because we just use uh, uh, half the number of GPUs and we still get a speed up, right? So cost performance is, is really, really good here. And smooth quant is uh, is a very interesting algo. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So the next one is called groupwise precision tuning quantization, aka GPTQ. So GPTQ is a static post training quantization technique, which means we will need a calibration data set to observe the distribution of, uh, of uh, activations and uh, decide how to rescale the weights. Okay, so there is going to be a calibration step. The number one thing that um, makes GPTQ interesting is it does introduce newer levels of quantization. So of course we get 8-bit and 4-bit, which we had before, but we can go down to 3 or even 2-bit precision. So pretty extreme quantization. Um, they use very, very advanced techniques. Um, um, the, the core of GPTQ is um, an algorithm called OBQ, Optimal Brain Quantization, which they heavily modified. Uh, I won't go into the algo. The math is really crazy and too crazy for this, uh, definitely. So uh, please go and read the research paper if you want to hurt yourself. Uh, I'm really more interested into the the benchmarks. And so if we apply 4-bit quantization, um, we get 4x memory savings compared to FP16. We get the same inference speed and we get pretty much zero performance degradation. Okay? But what's obviously interesting is what if we push this... Uh, to uh, more extreme quantization than 4-bit, okay? So look at this benchmark where we compare the, the baseline, again, blue highlight, 16-bit, with 3-bit quantization. Uh, and again, those are very large models that you can see, OPT-175B, Bloom-176B, 160, uh, so the, some of the biggest available. And we can see if we go to 3-bit quantization, we are very, very close to uh, the performance level of the baseline. And, uh, and these, are, uh, um, these are a mix of uh, lower is better and uh, higher is better values, right? So uh, wiki2 is, uh, is probably perplexity, so lower is better. And you can see um, on wiki2, we get pretty close to the baseline um, and um, and that's quite impressive 
um, because we did shrink from 16 bits to three bits, right? In terms of latency, um, the paper reports, again, three bit uh, quantization uh, of OPT175B. And we can see if we run this quantized version on, a, on an A100 GPU, we get 3.24x speed up, which is already very nice. And uh, just like for smooth quant, because we did shrink the model massively, we can move from five GPUs to only one, right? So that's a 5x cost reduction immediately. And then it's 3.24x faster. And that's another significant cost performance improvement. So you can see how quantization works. Uh, and um, this is really, really great, right? This is really great. Um, almost negligible performance degradation and huge cost performance benefits. And that's why quantization is such a, an important technique. And, and that's why you're totally right uh, watching those videos. Um, inference is pretty fast because it relies on uh, very, very fast kernels called X Llama V2. Uh, they're available on GitHub. So those kernels are uh, super optimized for uh, uh, four bit and, and maybe even lower uh, inference. So that's why uh, uh, GPTQ is quite fast. And uh, the great news is that stuff is in integrated in our open source libraries. And this is how it works, right? So load your model, uh, define a quantization config, how many bits you want, what uh, data set you want to use for calibration, and then just quantize it. And honestly, it couldn't be simpler. In terms of quantization uh, time, um, GPTQ um, takes four GPU hours to quantize a Bloom 176B, okay? So if you have a, a large multi-GPU instance, uh, you should be well under an hour. Uh, if you have a single GPU, then okay, it's a, it's a few hours. Uh, but it's definitely worth it, right? Uh, it's definitely worth it because, again, um, the, the cost performance improvement at inference time is pretty amazing. Okay, let's look at the next one. And the next one is called Activation Aware Weight Quantization, a.k.a. AWQ. So, again, AWQ is a static post-training quantization technique. Again, we'll need calibration for this. And uh, the new thing that AWQ introduces is um, the, the realization that a tiny fraction of the weights have a critical influence right they do have a, a major influence on the, the generation process and the quality of the generation process and so awq decides that they're so important that they will not be quantized so we will keep them in their original high precision format uh, these weights are called uh, salient weights and AWQ identifies them by looking at activations. So during the calibration process, um, 0.1 to 1% of the weights will be identified as um, uh, critical weights and, uh, and they will be left alone, okay? So what's the impact of this? Uh, okay, there's a lot to unpack, so let's take our time. If we look at the the FP16 baseline, again in blue, and compare it to uh, the int3 AWQ quantized model. Okay, so the, the green highlight in the middle, uh, we see that we are pretty close to the baseline once again for uh, LAMA and LAMA2 models. All of these, again, are perplexity scores. Again, lower is better. Okay, so for example, if we look at, let's say, LAMA to 70 billion, um, FP16 perplexity is 332, and AWQ perplexity at 3 bit is 3.74. Okay, and if we go down to uh, int4, we see perplexity is 341, which is very, very close 
to the baseline. Okay, and we see, you know, across the board, um, in four, perplexity is very close to the baseline. In three, just a tiny bit worse. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, the shrinking factor is, uh, is very, very interesting. So if we look at inference speed, and that's the right-hand graph, of course, we see different models being benchmarked. The light gray bar is uh, the, the baseline, FP16, and the red bar is uh, W4A16, which means 4-bit uh, weights, 16-bit activations. And we see that the speed up is pretty significant, almost 4x uh, faster. Um, and that's on uh, an NVIDIA 1490 GPU, which is uh, not the biggest and baddest GPU you can get, right? That's, that's one you can probably afford. Uh, the paper also has numbers for the 4070 GPU, which is something you could get in a laptop. I had to cut those numbers out because they wouldn't fit on the slide, but <laughs> they're, they're in the paper. But you can absolutely run those, uh, those large models with excellent performance on a 4070 GPU, which is, uh, which is really a, a consumer GPU. So AWQ is, uh, is really great. Um, and the, the degradation is minimal. The, the shrinking factor is very high. The speed up is very high, and again, it is very high uh, across the board, even for small models like uh, maybe Falcon 7D. Right? So a very cool technique. Another benefit of AWQ is that it doesn't need a lot of uh, calibration data, and, uh, and the paper shows that it is more robust across data sets. So that problem I mentioned in the first video where um, you could calibrate uh, statically with a data set get good result and then see uh, you know worse performance on a, another data set because the statistical properties are, are different I guess that problem is is kind of mitigated here um, and um, in fact the WQ also performs well on instruction tuned models um, and on multi models and on multimodal models so uh, just generally a more robust, um, um, a more generalized way to, to quantize models. So at the time of recording, um, Transformer supports uh, loading AWQ models. And in fact, you'll find uh, a lot of uh, AWQ quantized model on the Hogging Face Hub. Uh, if you want to do quantization, if you want to apply AWQ quantization, you can apply it with uh, one of those two libraries. Right? But it's at the moment, it's not built in uh, the Transformers library. You know, I guess it will be at some point, but not right now. Okay, so AWQ, very cool, um, very, very cool technique. Okay, let's move on. Uh, there's an even more recent one called HQQ, Half Quadratic Quantization. Uh, there isn't a research paper or none that I could find. Uh, there's a good blog post with uh, some of the math details. Uh, and, um, and there are also some uh, models on the Hugging Face Hub, which have been contributed by the authors. So thank you for that. So HQQ takes us back to dynamic post-training quantization. So we won't need a calibration data set. And in fact, that's the whole point, right? That's the key value proposition here. Now, HQQ uh, promises the same accuracy as uh, static uh, post-training quantization, but without the calibration phase. Um, again, the math is crazy. Uh, feel free to read it uh, in, in the blog post. But the, the key element here is uh, HQQ minimizes the quantization error by looking at weights. Um, not at activations, and it also takes care of model outliers. HQQ does outperform GPTQ and AWQ on most tests. Um, one obvious uh, area where it outperforms, of course, is the time it takes to quantize the models because it is dynamic quantization, so there is no calibration step. And uh, so in that blog post, uh, we see those numbers on an on a A100. It takes a little more than four hours to quantize Llama 270 billion with GPTQ, about a little more than an hour and a half 
for uh, AWQ and just four minutes for HQQ because again, no calibration required. If we look at performance, again, this is a bit busy, but let's unpack this. So the authors don't explicitly mention on which GPU this is happening. My guess is they're using an A100. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, interestingly, on the baseline, we see uh, Llama 2 70 billion doesn't even load. Okay. So if we look at the first green highlight, so HQQ G64, okay, that's four bit quantization with HQQ. Uh, we see perplexity is 5.3 compared to 5.18 in the baseline, so very close for uh, Llama 270. Uh, for Llama 27B. And we see memory usage is obviously much lower, about, I would say, 4x lower, 3 to 4x lower. And of course, we are able to load Llama 270B this time because of quantization and just less uh, space required to store the weights. If we go down to the next green highlight, we see again XQQG64. 3-bit quantization. Uh, perplexity is a bit worse, as you would expect, uh, but still, you know, still not too far from the from the baseline. Um, memory drops again. Uh, we only need uh, a few gigabytes to. So if we go down to the next highlight, HQQ GCC for three bits. Uh, we see perplexity is just a little worse compared to four bit, which is uh, which is expected, uh, and uh, and memory usage um, is uh, is a bit lower too, and that's good, right? We're still saving a, a few more gigs, and if we go all the way down to HQQG16, now we're quantizing at two bits. Again, perplexity now is uh, is I would say quite worse. Uh, than uh, than the baseline, but we are able to run uh, the models in, uh, in in even less uh, GPU memory. So as you as always, you know it's a trade-off between how much performance, how much uh, I would say business performance accuracy do you need, and how much um, cost performance do you expect, right? In terms of uh, speed, memory usage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but we can see um, this is this is pretty good, and uh, and of course we see that we um, match or outperform uh, GPTQ and AWQ on on most scenarios. So uh, that's that's great, right? Because now we can quantize in minutes and get, I guess, state of the art performance. All right. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is our own Optimum Intel library, which is built by my colleagues. So. Great job as usual. And that's a collaboration with our friends at Intel uh, where we focus on accelerating hugging face models on Intel architectures. And when I say Intel architectures, I don't only mean uh, Intel uh, Xeon CPUs, uh, I mean uh, a whole range of Intel platforms. So the point of Optimum Intel is to provide a very, very simple um, transformers like API and command line interface for two cool Intel tools. The first one is the Intel Neural Compressor, and the second one is Intel OpenVINO, and both are well known by now, I would say. So those tools uh, support uh, static quantization, dynamic quantization, quantization aware training. Uh, they also support uh, additional features like uh, pruning and distillation, but we're not discussing those today. Um, they have different recipes for quantization. You can select different algos, and SmoothQuant is available there. So if you want to try SmoothQuant, um, this is probably the easiest way to do it. And uh, here's a code sample, and as you will see, it is it is really uh, close to what you would do with uh, vanilla transformers. Um, this is an example where we run uh, dynamic uh, post-training quantization. Uh, we can set uh, a maximum threshold for uh, accuracy degradation. 
Uh, we can set the number of trials uh, we want so that the algo can try different settings. Uh, we can even provide a, an evaluation function to help the algo pick uh, the best uh, the best compromise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, and you don't need to understand, of course, all the finer and more complex points uh, on all those quantization techniques. The, the pre-existing recipes are are pretty cool. So, if you're um, if you're looking to optimize for Intel platforms, uh, this is a, this is a really good way to do it. And again, not just Leon's. Uh, go check out the Neural Compressor and OpenVINO for the list of Intel uh, CPUs and, and uh, other accelerators that are supporting. A while ago, I, I, I recorded a, a funny, uh, well, I found it funny, video on accelerating stable diffusion inference with OpenVINO. And, uh, and that's, on a, that's on a Xeon. And I take it down to five seconds. Uh, and, uh, and this goes to show starting from, I, if I remember correctly, I think 45 or 50 seconds and optimizing all the way down to five seconds, which would be acceptable for many scenarios. So uh, go and check that out. Um, see uh, how you can put this uh, OpenVINO toolkit to the test. Um, and that might be just good enough to save you from using GPUs. All right, that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you about quantization, and that was quite a lot. So go and review all this material and uh, try out those different techniques, read the papers, and you will, you will learn a lot. But of course, we'll see more quantization techniques pop up in the future, and uh, probably I will cover them again. Uh, so maybe there will be part three, who knows? Um, but one thing is sure, uh, quantization is here to stay. It's critical to shrink and accelerate models. And whether you're working in the cloud or whether you want to bring those models to smaller devices and to the edge, you will need quantization. So uh, good job on watching this. And until next time, keep rocking.